So we have 490,000 members in the SBD recorded in 2016. We have about a 10% membership growth, but just like the rest of the world, we have a huge retention problem. Um, the, the GC has asked us to record kingdom growth, which is where we look at our baptisms minus our apostasies and missing members, etc. So our real numbers in growth are only 44,000, but still God has been really good to us. This is my tithe report as of the end of July for each of the four unions. Um, Australia, we've got a number of our large conferences that are down. One of them is down 750,000 this year alone. So we've got some challenges in Australia. New Zealand, our union in New Zealand and the parts of the Pacific they care for are going really well. Papua New Guinea, we're having a really, really tough time. It's election year. Um, the election's only just finished. During election year, businesses don't, are not very stable. Um, business and family life is very disrupted. Church life is very disrupted. One of our missions there is down 80%. So we've got some huge challenges um, there. Trans-Pacific Union, um, they're overall going really well. However, again, it's that being really diligent with our um, church treasurers because what we're finding in the Trans-Pacific Union is the reporting from church treasurers to the mission is very late. So the money will be sitting in the mission account, but they don't know who it's from because they don't have the reporting and the reconciliation. Um, Vanuatu Mission is our standout. That really turned around after Cyclone Pam. Cyclone Pam wiped out most of their churches, but there was an incredible testimony because the tithe houses were left intact. And so our tithe has been going up in Vanuatu Mission ever since that. Peter Kulik, who now works in association with the General Conference, oversee a rebuilding program of all the churches, and all those churches have been rebuilt. And since then, we've done a really big push on insurance because we had most of the Trans-Pacific uninsured, um, which you know is a huge dilemma when you have something like a massive cyclone come through. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got some huge tithe challenges in Papua New Guinea. New Zealand is going well and all but one conference in Australia has um, only one conference has increased, the, uh, the others are all down. Western Australia has been having a tough time for a long time because of course Western Australia was hit hard by the mining downturn um, that happened a couple of years ago. What I've been doing since I was here in March last year um, or February last year I wrote a, a paper at the request of our administrators on the biblical position on insurance, even though the Bible doesn't talk about insurance. There are lots of principles that really support that insurance is a, is a good um, expression of biblical stewardship. So I put together a paper on that again because we have two unions with massive schools, systems, many, many hundreds of churches all uninsured. Um, so to try and just strengthen that because that's... You know, Australia can suffer from donor fatigue very quickly when they're continually asked to rebuild all of the time um, and you just run out of capacity and some of those schools now are worth millions of dollars and a community no longer has a capacity to rebuild it without help. Um, we've done stewardship advisories now in all of our unions. We, um, and then I've also done a lot of pastors' conferences starting with Vanuatu Mission um, then went to North New Zealand and did a pastors and elders training there for a weekend. Um, been helping the um, education department write presentations for school business managers to have better stewardship of our schools. We have a lot of languishing schools in the Pacific where just not basic stewardship is really letting down the students. So we have, we have teachers not being paid in school holidays. We have hardly any schools with toilets some really basic challenges there. So again, school finances and strengthening the stewardship around schools is really important. We hosted an SPD Tithe Summit based out of the Victorian Conference in November last year. It happened to time when Tim Acker was out um, for, as a GC representative to our SPD executive. So he came and presented there and Jeanette is going to distribute his presentation. 
He did a really powerful presentation that he wasn't, didn't have time to share this week about how you can take someone who's never tithed before, who maybe is living beyond their means and, and you know, has a cost structure in their home and help them bridge and transition to being able to pay tithes. So some really good principles to help with that transition. So we really appreciated his input there. Um, into this year have been busy on the roads. So I've already um, clocked up more than 90 days away this year. Starting with, um, unlike many of you, because I'm in the discipleship team at the SPD, I'm in working with all of my other colleagues very closely. So I get involved in lots of the other ministry areas, which opens up lots of doors and opportunities. So attended a major health summit and many of our local church health people are actually some of our most active lay people. So it was really great to be able to do some stewardship stuff at the health summit. I spent a week in Medang with all the pastors, elders and deacons there. Another week on Manus Island, very hot um, up there in the north, right up near the equator um, with pastors and elders. And this photo here is on Manus Island at the end of our week. We had about 200 pastors and elders and deacons for the week there. Um, I got the opportunity to do O Week, which is our orientation week at Avondale College and do some stewardship stuff for the new students there. I spent a weekend with the South New Zealand Conference pastors. Um, they're a small team, but a really dynamic conference that's in a really healthy um, place. Their leader is uh, president is Fijian, and he does something that is in Acts chapter 16, and he travels around his conference regularly. And in Acts chapter 16, it says that the, the leaders after the Jerusalem Council traveled around sharing the decisions made with the churches. And it, the way that they shared it was so encouraging that the church actually multiplied as a result. And he's been doing this every three months. He goes on a road show of all of his churches and his tithe is up 10%. Um, has he just, you know, I guess has that high contact, high relationship between admin and, and the churches in, in that conference. So it's a really great role model to, to watch and see the impact there. Another really big, one of, I guess, my really big rocks or my, when you sort of think about all the things that you could do and what would make the most difference, one of them is an opportunity that's come a little bit out of left field and I'll tell you how it started. I knocked on the door of Rod Brady, our CFO for the SPD and I said, can we stop spending so much time asking our members to give and tell them more about what's happening with their tithe and offering? Let's be more transparent about how the church is using the money because as an insider, I was seeing that the story was really good. And he said, Christina, you will kill yourself doing this because our system hasn't been designed to report. You will literally have to knock on every department door at every level of the church to get this information. And if you leave anyone out, you'll pay the political consequences. And when you knock on the door, they don't have systems in place to gather those insights either. So he said, it's a systematic thing um, that, that we need a whole system overhaul to, to, in order to do that. Because I'm on the ADRA Australia board and every you know, year we produce an impact report for our donors, telling them exactly how their money has been used. And I said, you know, that we can, we can do this as a church, as a division. A month later, he knocked on my door and he said, guess what? The Australian government is going to force us to tell our impact. A new accounting standard is in draft um, status. It's called an exposure draft for the Australian accounting standards. Um, it's already law in New Zealand where we will have to tell our donors, our tithe and offering, because we're a registered charity, what impact their money is having. We'll have to articulate our effectiveness and our efficiency at using the money for the outcomes that we get to select. The Australian government won't select our outcomes, we'll get to select them. So this is a lot of work. We have 70 entities in the South Pacific Division. We've sat on several committees mapping a list of about 25 outcomes that we can measure and then map them back to the 70 entities in order to make it a manageable task. And we've actually contracted an American to help us, um, Calvin Edwards, who is one of the authors. He's based in Atlanta, Georgia. He's one of the editors of the Stewardship Bible. And he's been out to the SPD three times and he's one of the world leaders on measurable ministry outcomes. Um, so he's helping us to map these outcomes and for us to prepare 
to start reporting to the Australian government. But of course, the big benefit will be is that that information will be available to our members. And that will, f that will be, a m that this is the biggest organisational change that would have hit us as an SPD in the last 100 years. So it's very exciting opportunity from a stewardship perspective because I see a millennial generation that's hungry to know how their church is using the money and I can see that that end is in sight even though there's a lot of work between now and then. I got the opportunity to do a week of prayer, so a one-hour worship for five days in a row at our Trans-Pacific Union mission office with all of the staff there. Unfortunately, we don't have a full-time stewardship director, but it was wonderful to spend five hours of stewardship training time with everyone from the union office to build their stewardship capacity to use in their ministry areas where they have a chance. Um, spent some time with Fiji Mission with their pastors, elders and, and members. We have a CFO conference every two years right across the SBD that brings in people from sanitarium, Sydney Adventist Hospital, schools, aged care, all the churches was able to participate and play a role in that this year, which was wonderful. I had the privilege of being able to go for a week to Israel and go on a, a um, following Jesus tour, looking, going from not from a history perspective, but from a movement building perspective. How did Jesus create a movement? Um, and that was a real benefit to my teaching. I spent oh, about five days in Samoa, traveling around to nine districts, teaching um, in each of those districts. Samoa is a really interesting one and I wanted to mention a couple of things because I'm looking for some help with Samoa. Samoa would have to be one of the epicenters in the world of Christendom. 99% of people in Samoa are Christian. When you get off the plane, you drive past a $17 million congregational church. The churches are the best in the world there. Then you drive past a massive Methodist church um, and the, the culture there is you've got a lot of money pouring in from the US and some of these churches actually pay their members to attend. Some of them, um, the culture of gifting to pastors is very high. I was sent there by the TPUM union president and the SPD leadership to deal with their rising concern about corruption amongst the pastors in Samoa Mission. As I flew across the ocean, it's a very long flight, I said, Lord, you have to help me with this. This is really, really challenging. Um, what I discovered is that they have to pay um, a massive amount of money for entry into a village to plant a church. And so those pastors take out a loan. And yes, the members, because they're, they're surrounded by neighbours who are Protestant, who are tithing directly to the pastor, and their culture is to treat the pastor like a chief, the gifting thing is, a, is, is huge, that gifting culture. My conclusion is I need some insights from you if any of you are dealing with that similar situation, um, that if you could give me some guidance and some wisdom there. I did this trip to kind of collect and understand what's happening and what the challenges are, but we'll need to work with them over the long term. But my conclusion was that against this incredible Christendom around them, um, they are doing really well within that context because of the incre cor uh, incredible corrupt practices of some of the denominations around them. Um, and of course, they've got that, that really strong influence and um, it's making the pastors feel quite powerless. So that's a huge need and a huge prayer there is how we can continue to support them to be biblical and, and have integrity. Um, Vanuatu Mission is, is one of our rising stars. The, the CFO is the stewardship director there, has really taken hold of this stuff and God has been very faithful to them and with their meagre resources they're able to do incredibly big things and God continues to multiply um, their efforts there. Um, right at this moment, this afternoon, I've got a, a, pre a presentation due to Vanuatu Mission because tomorrow the CFO sits in front of the Prime Minister of Vanuatu presenting a biblical perspective on tax reform. Um, so I've got a presentation on the biblical perspective on tax reform that I just need to do the final touches to and that goes off for that tomorrow. So I get um, involved in lots of interesting things. This is a photo from the recent trip to Vanuatu, the CFO of Vanuatu Mission, um, the tithe auditor from Trans-Pacific Union and the associate CFO from TPUM. We spent two days training pastors and church treasurers on how the church treasury function. We mixed in stewardship teaching with 
a functionality teaching and I've found that to be a really good model. So we'll now replicate this teaching to some other districts that are really, really important um, um, to the church. And that was our group of treasurers trained. We did something really beautiful on the Sabbath. They call it the bucket ministry. Um, every family takes a bucket and on Sabbath after church, we made sure that every household in that particular town where the district meeting was being held got a bucket of goodies, prayer and a, a visit basically from an Adventist family. So we were all distributed around the town, um, thousands of us, um, giving out buckets to all of the households and just praying blessing into their lives. It was a really beautiful, beautiful thing to do. What are some of the projects that I'm working on? Um, we work with Greater Sydney Conference to do an I Am Steward campaign. So I've got a, a package of resources. It's got sermons and a USB and all kinds of resources in there. Um, E-giving, which I told you about earlier. Um, filming some radio, or doing recording some radio and film content in Fiji next month. Um, lots of weekend sermons. I get asked by my leaders a lot to write a lot of statements on the biblical basis of different, different parts of our church life. Um, I'm the local church treasurer at my local church, which has been a good experience. We're making some short videos um, with some scripts using the Sabbath school lesson for quarter one next year. So we'll just share them with you when we've got them done. Um, we're actually doing a video story, which I'll get shared with you on one particular church in Australia that's very generous with foreign missions. And as a result, their tithes and offerings continue to grow on their home front. God is really blessing them on the home front because it's a wonderful testimony of this reflex reaction that Alan White talks about in Councils on Stewardship. So we're doing a video story specifically on that key message only to share across the SPD. Um, this is my home church, College Church, Avondale College Church. You know, a comment was made the other day that the educated struggle to tithe and here is a university church and we were struggling to tithe. Um, we tithe and offering had been going down for four years. We got a new pastor this year, he's Samoan. He's been visiting the households um, this year for the first time and tithe and offering has really turned around as a result of that visitation. But I just wanted to show you what else we're doing. The, I call this a narrative budget. And instead of presenting to our church a line item budget, we actually have divided our church story into parts of our story. We set a stretch target for what we needed. And so that made it easy to communicate our budget to the church. And what we really focus on is missions, including special offerings. So in there is all your general conference and division special offerings. Because what was happening in, a, in the SPD is that those offerings weren't being highlighted, even though they were being given to on a Sabbath, they weren't being reported on because it's kind of a, the church treasurer receives that money and because it's for Adventist World Radio, it goes straight out again. So it actually wasn't showing up in the local church statement. So the church members were never celebrating what contribution that they were giving. So we've turned that reporting around and really starting to celebrate this contribution. And it's, it's like when you, when you celebrate generosity, generosity actually happens. Um, what are the, what's the context I'm in? I'm in the discipleship team. This is a photo of us. So my colleagues are in youth ministry, church planting, etc. And we all have our specialty areas, but we sit within the one team with the one director. So I'm not a stewardship department, even though I actually in practice still can function that way. Um, I'll skip over that because I've run out of time. I've had to write a lot of presentations and I'll put here some of the topics that may not be typical stewardship topics in case any of you want any of these resources on different um, things. And I'm looking for more stuff that can help me with, um, particularly in the missions in the Pacific to help them to become more self-reliant. So if you can help me with anything, I'll be grateful. Just to finish off with a little stewardship story, when I took on this role and I never put my hand up for it, and as I shared last time I was here, I'm not a pastor. I'm, you know, f sometimes still go, how did this happen that I was a marketing person and ended up working in the SPD at Stewardship? But God has been really faithful to my family. And even though I've traveled a lot and that's hard with young children, this is my son last Sabbath. Um, our senior pastor didn't tell me, but he called him up because the Sabbath before, this family had a profession of faith. The mum is a Baptist. Um, and she's now become an Adventist. The dad was from Hillsong, baptised at Hillsong Church. 
this little boy and Jack are friends and they met at preschool, like before they went to school. And Jack invited Luke to church and as a result, the whole family came and they became Seventh-day Adventists like the Sabbath before. So this last Sabbath, um, and they said as part of their testimony, the dad said, it was Jack Hawkins that invited us to come to church and that's why we're here. And so our senior pastor surprised us by calling my son up and thanking him for modelling mission and disciple making to the church. Um, he was crying, the pastor, and he said, you better sit down and make me stop crying. But it was, I, for me, it was a moment of my life feels chaotic now. I travel. I'm so busy. It seems at odds with my season in life, but God has been good and faithful and, and continues to bless my children.